Uh, um, at the beginning, I would like to thank the organizing, uh, you know, um, team, uh, which invited me to this uh, wonderful uh, webinar, and um, uh, and I think it's very important. And thanks a lot for the first um, speaker for the great you know, overall about the pathophysiology and the clinical presentation of COVID-19. Uh, what I'm going to go through uh, in my presentation is probably a complementary to the first presentation. And um, I think when we talk about the treatment of COVID-19, there are a lot, a lot of issues. Uh, being a new virus, being something that we didn't know about it previously, we have a lot. The literature is filled with a lot of articles and new research that really sometimes is confusing for all of us. So when we talk about the COVID-19, you know, it's, you know, for everybody now, you know, you know, as clinical, you know, physicians or nurses, they know that more than 35 million actually are affected and more than 1 million deaths from COVID-19. And actually the big question that comes to our mind, how much we know about the treatment. And I can tell you that really just the top of the iceberg because whatever we know, and I think we've been through it since February, at least in Bahrain, till now we're talking about eight to nine months and still we are debating some of the modality of the treatment and we know that the whole world is doing the same. Uh, when we talk about the treatment, and I think it's very important to really correlate it with patient safety issue, because how much you can do and actually help the patient for treatment, it depends on several parameters. The main, 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 main points are knowledge and expertise. And you know, whether the patient, they're actually uh, knowing about it, the risk of illness, and I think we know all those factors, the social circumstances, and we know that with COVID-19, there were a lot of social and even psychological issue. Uh, the attitude to risk, some people, they will really think that it's really serious disease, they will stay home, and the rest will say, no, it's not important, I can go out and really don't really think about the seriousness of the illness. And a lot of values and preference. From the clinician point of view, which we are, a lot of issues since the beginning, diagnosis, how accurate is our diagnosis, uh, the etiology, the virus, we know something about it right now. The prognosis, we talked about, you know, in the first presentation, it was very beautiful uh, talking about, you know, the presentation, but major part of COVID-19 is a long-term complication that we get to know by seeing this patient, you know, neurological, cardiological, thromboembolic, all this actually will come even after the patient gets better and even if they have mild symptoms or mild pneumonia. The treatment options and the outcome we were really trying to get the best. And this is the general rule. When we talk about a specific topic in patient safety, medication, we have to think really seriousness. Take in consideration most of the treatment, if not all the treatment we are using now in COVID-19 are investigational, being, being used for other diseases, and they are not free of side effects and drug, inter, drug interactions. So you have to keep that in the, ba in the back of your mind. We cannot start all medication but you have to be really serious about it. Steps in medication that really can go wrong, prescription, administration, and monitoring. So you have to have a system in your institution. That's what we do in our institution. Either we give the medication according to Bahrain protocol, and I know all the countries, they have their own protocol. Then we have to monitor all the prescription, how it was administered, and if there is side effects. So that's part of quality improvement in your institution, and it would help you a lot. So uh, in analyzing your cases in your ICU or on the floor, who is at risk for medication or all? who it may go wrong with them? If they are multiple medication, and we know most of our patients, especially if they are elderly, they have a lot of comorbidities, they are taking a lot of medication, and most of these medications with COVID-19 are not benign, and they have a lot of drug-drug interaction. Patients that are taking, you know, um, they have other issues that need adjustment. So they have renal impairment, pregnant or not pregnant, liver diseases, and you have to adjust these medications. Uh, patient who cannot communicate because sometimes they have, you know, allergies or can, they cannot tolerate or they don't want to be taken any of the investigation drugs. It can be a problem. Patient have more than doctor. Sometimes we get admission to our facilities and we have to get back to their, uh, you know, rheumatologist, their GI, their surgeon, whoever has been dealing with the patient to get the exact story. And then patient who does not uh, take active role in the medication use where you need their communication with you. The other part is the babies or their pediatric age group for the doses. 
these are very important. This is where probably it can go wrong. So uh, the situation that really help, you know, it does not help when we go with medication before we go with the actual protocols and experience, you know, all of us are inexperienced when we started. Now we have some experience with it, rushing because we have those cases coming all the time, doing two things at the same. You know, as healthcare worker, we did like force, you know, by the nature of this pandemic to really handle a lot of stress and number of cases within the same hours of working or even longer hours. Interruption by a lot of people are asking and then even fatigue or stress, which really, you know, it can restrict our ability to perform and lack of checking. And that's when I say you have to have a good medication review and incident reporting in your institution. So now um, uh, when we built it, this is a nice article which was published about patient safety done in around, you know, 71 hospital in Pennsylvania where they link patient safety issues with the COVID-19. And if you see that number uh, nine is the medication, we all can relate to this issue in our uh, experience with COVID-19. At the same time, they saw what are the most common COVID-19 related events that will really compromise the patient care. And you see that missed or delayed care for treatment was part of this delay. So keep this in your mind before we go to the actual uh, protocols. This is article is very important, I think. It talks about scientific literature and COVID-19, and it's related to safety issue. As I said, we were really, uh, I'm sure you remember the days that, you know, there were like articles saying hydroxychloroquine is good, and then another day it has been uh, pulled out of the, uh, you know, uh, the most of the protocols, and again, they are questioning it. You know, even around the severe, using it for which cases, specification. So we are trying to follow as much as we can from what is happening and it's really sometimes confusing. So the number of articles talking about, you know, the coronavirus and treatment, we are talking about this year, this is the highest year of publication. This is where we can really get confused as a healthcare worker. And, you know, most of the application probably went to China and now probably in North American countries where they probably most of the publication are coming from. So where is this related, COVID-19 related issue? Medication is a major issue of it. So keep it in your mind, because even if we have good evidence, a lot of issue about medication and patient safety. So I'll give just outlook about the IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, and then I'll keep bring you back to the region and to Bahrain protocol. We'll not go into the details of the evidence and all the articles, but I think it's very important to see the IDSA not as probably the best, but as kind of something that we can compare our protocols to them. For example, it will go one by one and try to compare it. I, I'm not sure what's the protocol you are using currently in Iraq, but I'm sure it's plus minus the same, you know, with uh, as we are doing in other countries. So recommendation one is against using hydroxychloroquine, and that's for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. And I'm telling you that it was on and off a lot of guidelines, even in Gulf countries guidelines and even Bahrain guidelines. So we still use it in limited cases. Recommendation two. It talks about against also hydrochloroquine plus azithromycin. I'm sure that you know that this combination uh, is really worrisome to everybody because of the risk of arrhythmias and acute prolongation. So I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people are now not using it. And if you want to treat a community acquired pneumonia, you probably can add, for example, doxycycline instead of azithromycin. That will make it easier. In regard to hydroxychloroquine, as I said, it's against recommendation only in clinical trials. But I can tell you in our GCC, we put it with low evidence and even in Bahrain, we have it in limited cases. Recommendation three talks about the recommendation of retinovir, uh, the HIV medication. We have a lot of long standing you know, experience with Kelly for HIV medication. And actually the, uh, the uh, evidence behind it for COVID-19 was probably one randomized uh, control trial and two case series, and they saw a little bit improvement, you know, decreased the uh, duration of presentation, but not effect on mortality. So I know that a lot of guidelines has removed it. Uh, we kept it probably in GCC and moved it from uh, behind guidelines. Dexamethasone, one of the, you know, the only probably, you know, two drugs I can say, Dexamethasone is one of the drugs that really changed the way we are treating um, uh, COVID-19. But that's very specific to the people who have respiratory 
you know, I'm talking about severe disease or critical disease, and they need oxygenation and probably mechanical ventilation. So if we are talking about critically ill patient, and this is very important when you are putting guidelines for treatment, especially with COVID-19, you know, uh, an infectious disease we treat, you know, for example, pneumonia, yes, we have mild and severe. I think with COVID-19, it's because, and I think the uh, previous speaker just mentioned, it's a syndrome. So you have mild, moderate, severe. So even when you go and read an article or a study about a drug, make sure to check they use it for which category, not only by the name. So if they label it as critical or severe, go and see what was their definition of critical and severe. Believe me, it will be different than yours probably. So that's what's happened even when we are uh, meeting with the uh, Gulf countries hour and trying to uh, put a kind of guidelines for treatment, we found that the definition is different. So they define the critically in IDSA, the critically ill patient as the, those patients who need mechanical ventilation in, or ECMO. So it's beneficial and you can start, you know, the dose we know, dexamethasone, six milligram IV, you know, for 10 days or until discharge because the duration has been proved should be less like five days in other severe or moderate cases. So that's really help us in decrease the oxygen requirement for our patient. Recommendation five is again, the dexamethasone and for severe cases who needs oxygen and their saturation is 90, this is the 94% to room air. So it's helpful, but you can go also with, you know, probably five, five days. Recommendation six talks about, you know, all other non-severe oxygen saturation is good. They suggest against use of steroids. So, you know, it's basically severe cases and critical who needs oxygen, you know, oxygen requirement. So that I think has been there. So the summary of evidence in this slide go critical, severe, and non-severe. And I'm sure you heard all of you about the recovery trial, which, you know, uh, the new care, a large number of patients, but you know, there was a lot of issue about, you know, that was not double blinded randomization, but you know, that study actually, which really was a game change for all of us and started using dexamethasone. And by the way, you can use dexamethasone or equal steroid, whatever potency you have that equal to it, you can convert at the same time. Recommendation seven talked about the, against the use of tocilizumab. I'm sure uh, we used it, we used it for a long time. I think it helped and you know that, I think from the first presentation, the path of surgery, the disease, a major part of it was the cytokine storm. You have really the patient are very sick with high LDH, ferritin, IL-6, IL-1, and you try and actually help to decrease the, the, severe, the severity of the symptoms. But you know, I can tell you my experience didn't affect mortality and we have a study undergoing to see the results. So they are, I did say, say, don't use it as a routine, probably in clinical trials or select your cases. Because these are biological agents where really we found a lot of infection post use, bacterial infection or even fungal infection. Uh, recommendation eight was talking about the, uh, the convulsant plasma. I'm sure also you heard about all those, you know, uh, the studies that went and one day they and as one study will come and say you know it's perfect decrease mortality and this is the best treatment and another one will come the second day they say okay they didn't touch mortality and probably just decrease the duration of symptoms so i can tell you from our experience yes it can help in decreasing symptoms correcting some of the labs but i'm not sure that it can so further study are awaited for to really to you know give us really what's happening with the plasma the convulsions plasma Recommendation nine actually talks about the um, uh, the antiviral. You know, when we talk about the remdesivir, remdesivir actually became the only one drug that's probably a kind of anti anti COVID. Uh, and and you know what? You know, it's all the drug. You know, it's a new, not a new drug has been used for other viruses. But actually, it's they are suggesting to use remdesivir versus non-antiviral, and especially, you know, for severe cases. And if you remember the definition of severe is oxygenation less than 94% and room air. Again, for in regard to the, uh, to the remdesivir, again, here it talks about the five days, you don't need to go for 10 days, like, you know, even the steroids, you know, we're talking like up to 10 days, you can go. Here also, you can make it shorter if duration, if you don't have to go longer. Only for sick people, you can go longer and reach 10 days. Recommendation number 11 was about 
also the remdesivir. And they say that, you know, you can use it among severe cases on supplemental, but not those cases that really end. You know, at the end, we are talking about an antiviral agent, which probably at the end, when you have those patients with ARDS and ECMO, probably it won't change. But, you know, you can, you know, some people I know, our ICU and, you know, I just physician, they would love to extend it a little bit, just, you know, maybe the patient can get benefit of it. So it's really not strong recommendation for those cases. Number 12, it talks about the severe cases and famotidine. You know, famotidine, you know that you used it for as anti-acid. And uh, probably heard it, you know, recently when Trump did the COVID-19 and he took within those cocktail medication, he took also famotidine. So there is some, there's one of the study that says you know, George, I mean, I think there was uh, uh, an internet problem. We will wait for a few seconds to resume the conduction on the presentation. Meanwhile, we are waiting Dr. Jamila to resume uh, her presentation. I just want to uh, again, again uh, remember uh, all of the attendees confirmed that writing their name in a correct way. So now I have a five names that I can see in between the attendees are putting the name of their uh, phones. Uh, uh, kindly, just to confirm which the name have been who participated with. And again, uh, those who participate in their Arabic names, uh, if they want, uh, if they would like uh, to get their certificates with their Arabic uh, name, uh, there is no problem. However, those who participate with their emails without changing uh, code to their name, again, they would have a problem in. Uh, uh, resuming and in uh, obtaining their certificates. I am receiving your question now and waiting Dr. Jamila for a few seconds to overcome the... Uh, Dr. Basimi, I'm back. I'm not sure. Okay, Dr. Stopped Jamil. all of a sudden. Can, can you resume, can you resume uh, since the last uh, one minute? Because we get a uh, problem with the internet and we lose the connection with you. Okay, so uh, I think the last two slides were uh, not uh, If you can share it again. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'm not sure what's happened. Okay. Uh... Yes. yes. Uh, I think we reached the recommendation um, from the severe. We're talking about from the severe. Uh, yes. Okay. So the last thing I think we were talking about is remdesivir treatment. And as I said, it's really one of the drugs that we can say it's anti-COVID, but it's really, you know, we know it's helping, but, you know, not sure if it really decreased the mortality, but it's really, it can decrease the duration. And that was even the first trial which was published and said that it can decrease the duration and manifestation, but no clear effect on mortality. We talk about remdesivir. Uh, I'll move to the uh, famotidine, we talked about it, yes. So those are the major medications that we can say they are really, uh, has been there most of the protocols, they have all of them or some of them. There are several treatment under investigation, they are really not strong evidence, you know, like using other anti-HIV uh, medication, using Kelitra, which is lepunavir, retinavir with interferon, and actually we use it in Bahrain for in a couple of months, then we had to pull it because we saw a lot of complication, drug drug interaction. So this is one. The other one is convulsant plasma as a prophylaxis. Still, we need more about it. Ribavirin, we used it also in Bahrain initially, but we found that's really, a, you know, you know, our experience with ribavirin, even from the previous, you know, as antiviral, it has a lot of toxicity. 
you know, the Tamiflu, you know, it was actually used only in China when the disease has started in Wuhan. And there are no further that can tell you that it's probably helpful. I remember the first guidelines we put in Bahrain based on China experience, we had it as one of the treatment, but then we removed it within a couple of weeks, actually, because we didn't think that's really helpful. The intravenous immunoglobulin, that's still not there. A lot of investigation, I know even recently a lot of talk about it, but still we are waiting more actually studies to tell us if it's going to work or not. The other thing, NSAIDs. NSAID, um, it's not, you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. I'm sure that happened, you know, like three, four months ago, a lot of talks about, can you go and use NSAID when the patient has COVID-19? And there is a lot of, you know, talk about the pathophysiology. It may affect like badly patients who have COVID-19, but nothing really confirmed and it still can be used. Uh, so further actually studies needed in this part. Uh, the other thing is the use of ACE inhibitors or ARP for patient cardiovascular hypertensive. Actually, and we went through this period where almost two to three months, everybody's talking to stop them, not to use them because they really affect the patient. But as of now, most of the recommendation, the professional scientific actually um, societies, they say you can keep those medication going because it's not proven that actually it will have a, a negative actually impact. Febipravir, this is a good, you know, uh, we added to our actually guidelines in Bahrain. I know it's been used, it's been used in other countries like China, I think Japan, because it was an initial drug in Japan, used for uh, flu actually, and actually used even in Russia for treatment COVID-19. Still nothing conclusive about it. And I know that most of our countries in the Gulf and even internationally, there are a lot of studies are looking for its outcome. It may have a role in mild diseases only, but I'm not sure that can affect even the mortality. The other major medication that a lot of studies are going about it is the immunomodulator. You know, I think the pathophysiology was explained very well by the previous uh, presenter, and we know it's a major, major role in the presentation and actually uh, poor prognosis for our patient COVID-19. But the problem with these agents, as we know them, we use them for other diseases, uh, you know, like autoimmune, GI, rheumatology, we know they are not safe medication you know, and we started using a couple of them, in, you know, in addition to the, to Silizumab, actually in Bahrain, we tried the IL-1 inhibitor, the Enkenra, and we found that after using it, a lot of bacterial infection and, you know, even fungal infection, so actually as of last week, we stopped using it, uh, not selective, not routine, we just remove it altogether from our protocol. The other, you know, um, uh, immunomodulator, you can use JAK inhibitors, you know, there's some studies about, you know, a couple of these drugs, we will not go in the details, but you can read the, um, the studies behind them. And you have the GMCSF inhibitor also, there are a couple of studies about them, but actually not conclusive, I'm not sure that will help, and complement inhibitor. Just keep them back of your mind, if you hear anything about them, may, about these, maybe we'll find something in the literature in the couple of, uh, of next couple of months. This is very important. When we talk about antibacterial, antifungal, within the whole like COVID uh, kind of pandemic, we notice, and I'm talking about from the background as infectious disease and actually in charge of the antibiotic stewardship uh, program in, in my hospital actually and in national in Bahrain. Uh, we found a large like increase, actually huge increase in consumption of antibiotic. All patients admitted with bilateral pneumonia, our you know, chest, ICU, not all of them, but they prefer to cover them because they think about co-infection or superimposed. You know, I highlighted a couple of actually articles which was published and actually the rate of bacteremia, like when New York was only 5.6%, other positivity of blood culture was very low. Most of it are less than 10%. So take in consideration that it's not really high within the COVID patients community. So this is like a kind of discordance between why we are using large amounts of, that's why I'm saying large, because it's really covering large number of patients, despite we don't have a high incidence or prevalence of bacterial infection. Keep in mind, a couple of articles has been out. Don't neglect the stewardship during the pandemic. We know that COVID-19 will accelerate the antimicrobial resistant, and we have to look for the long-term impact of antimicrobial resistant because it's there. We use more of antibiotic, you will develop resistant ultimately. Uh, ultimately. 
WHO actually warned against it and highlighted actually your stewardship program if you have or any recommendation, please make it as a fundamental part of your treatment of COVID-19 and not to be overlooked because of the seriousness of COVID-19 cases. And they, uh, a nice article was published to look into which hospital, what parameter that can favor MDRO increase or decrease. Uh, in our experience from Bahrain, and I just put you know a couple of them here, that we have increased empiric antibiotic. Uh, stewardship has been affected, you know, because we couldn't maintain the same manpower because we have the manpower has to be actually diverted to COVID area. Infection control measures are much much better, but there is a big difference there because our healthcare worker thinking of preventing themselves from getting COVID-19 but they didn't imply the best infection control between dealing patients. So if any patient develops Mars A, he may you know, take it to another patient. So you, know, you have to really to be very careful with it. Uh, we have immunocompromised patient. We have increased length of stay for the moderate and severe cases, most of them like 10 to 21 days on average. And we had a couple of outbreaks that we have to deal with them in order to control uh, what, what we have been doing. This is the last updated you know, um, guidance from you know, United States. Actually, they concentrated about two drugs. And I, as I mentioned, probably these are the only two that probably change a little bit how we are dealing with COVID-19 is the remdesivir and dexamethasone. The rest, I'm not sure uh, that they are actually helping that much. So the last part of my presentation, I'll go just quickly over the GCC and Bahrain. We'll not go into the details. I'll just highlight. This is a GCC protocol. We worked on it in a team representation from the Gulf countries. I was heading the team. And we went through a lot of discussion, it took us two months actually to develop it. And by, by the time we were developing, a lot has been changed also. So first of all, we did risk stratification and we really had an agreement, what mild, what moderate, what severe cases and what's critical. And then what's ARDS and then we put the treatment. So we took each medication, you know, paracetamol, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine. And if you just, I'll go back to the slide. Yeah, see uh, the part of evidence. We said either there is sufficient evidence, insufficient evidence, or no evidence at all. And level of recommendation, A is strong, B is recommended case by case, and C is against using it. And I think these guidelines are still valid till today because we were very clear about it. And I think the expert we met with them, they're very knowledgeable expert. So we'll go, for example, on this year, we said yes, recommended for severe to critical. And by the way, this was written and I think end of August. So till today, it's valid. It's the same, the IDSA recommendation. And again, when uh, Fabi Brabir, you said there is some recommendation, but not, you know, that strong. And I know the GCC, they are Gulf countries, they're trying to include it in their protocols. We have about tocilizumab, the same thing. It's used, how to use it, in which cases. Interferon, we were not really, some of the experts believed in it make a big difference. And then dexamethasone, probably dexamethasone had the highest rating from our, us as experts because we saw the difference it made to our life when we start steroids in these cases. Then we have the anticoagulation. This is major. I didn't really talk too much about anticoagulation, but as, as our knowledge of COVID-19 had evolved, we know there is a, a huge like uh, impact of the thromboembolic phenomena. And you can use prophylaxis dose or therapeutic dose. And you know, it depends on the D dimer, how you see the patient. But now I think most of the articles that's coming in the picture, that actually they will recommend therapeutic dose because even when they are prophylaxis, we saw patient developing different kinds of thromboembolic phenomena. And then we have the plasma. And then we have, you know, please do not forget or not as for the pediatric multisystemic inflammatory syndrome, because really we saw it in pediatric, it's associated with high mortality and specific management plan for it. Bahrain National Protocol is probably plus minus. We have a lot that we tackle in that protocol. Actually, we updated all the time. The last updated actually just last week about everything, the admission, diagnosis, readmission, mortality, whom we labeled them uh, COVID or not COVID. The treatment, the treatment part, we put the general assessment. We put all for, this is for the mild cases, what you have to do with medication and some for pneumonia, moderate and severe and for the ARDS. Even we added oxygenation and ventilation. I'm sure if I have, you know, from the audience are our colleagues from ICU, they know it's really 
uh, tough to deal with those patients, even with the higher requirements, high PEEP, just you know, to give them the amount of oxygen really they need. Really uh, severe, severe cases of ARDS we are seeing. The antithrombotic, we have protocol for the hospital, and please keep in mind post-discharge thromboembolic treatment, because we saw patients, after they discharge, they come back again to us with actually a major like PE or MI or any mesenteric ischemia, you name it. We saw most of these cases currently. So this is how you can score your patient and then decide whether they need post-discharge antithrombotic or not. Uh, we leave all the medication, we have them by the dose, indication, contraindication, when you use them, when you don't use them. QT prolongation was a major for us because we are still using hydroxychloroquine and try to make the benef best benefit of what we are putting in our protocol. Uh, this is the hydroxychloroquine, febiprabir we have it, tocilizumab, and I end up by don't really underestimate what you can do. We are helping our people with the COVID-19 treatment, but please look for the hospital acquired infections in your ICU because they will probably will be increasing. So a lot of managing uncertainty in the new normal of COVID-19 and probably you have all the time to review and change your protocol to adapt to the amount of knowledge we are getting uh, in our life. And I think that will evolve you know, as we are talking. And again, I think the COVID-19 just really emphasized the professionalism of the health system. We as physicians, it really has to be uh, the most important things that can deal, save people's life and actually improve the quality of services. This is where I think the value of healthcare worker, uh, it was very clear in this pandemic. Everybody's thanking the healthcare worker because we were there in the front line dealing with the patient when it was, you know, probably not all people wants to deal with the cases. So I think this is very important. And for any health care system to improve, you have to change and make change every day. So you're doing the work and working in the work. And that's what I think one of the teaching lessons from COVID-19, keep learning, you know, improve what you are doing and try to make the best. Correlated with patient safety all the time and quality. And I like this saying, you know, tell me facts, I learn, we learn, you know, we as a healthcare worker, we learn, you know, and, you know, we grasp information really good. Tell me the truth, I believe you. This is when transparency with numbers and discussion has to be there. But when you tell me a story, it will live in my heart forever. And I think with COVID-19, actually, we had a lot of stories to tell. And sometimes you feel really helpless when you cannot do much to uh, your patient. But please start small with one patient, one day, one admission, and you as one clinician. And I'm sure you can do it as a team because, you know, and all the time I say thank you, Team Bahrain, because really we work too hard to make really the best of our services and save life as much as we can. And I'm sure even in Iraq and other countries. So if you want to go so go fast, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, you have to go together. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenny, for this nice elaboration for the topics and recommendation of the Bahrain guidelines in the treatment of COVID-19. Surely, behind COVID-19, there will be a lot of facts, a lot of truth, a lot of stories uh, here and there and everywhere. COVID-19 is an